Somebody asked me this question yesterday, and the problem was, uh, do we have children in the audience? <laughs> yeah. And they're not, this is not a, these are not family-oriented stories. Uh, but I will tell you that David was the victim of a number of great jokes uh, that Jason and I put together. And uh, Jay, David was funny because David probably had one of the most difficult jobs in the show. So much dialogue. And, you know, he and I worked long hours. And sometimes he'd get pretty grumpy for the end of the day. And one day, he, he drives this little red echo. And you see him buzzing around, he's got some GPS, he's like, And, and he was really grumpy toward the end of the day, and I jump in my car, which is a, you know, double cab Ford truck. And Jason and I are driving back from set, which is an hour away from Vancouver. And it's like 16 hours, and we see, we see David on the highway. And he's been bitching and moaning about everything all day long. And so finally, we're like, we pull up to him. Jason pulls his pants down and just like. <laughs> he didn't just, I mean, he worked. I didn't know David had to white that big. He almost drove off the road. It was such a disturbing sight. And then finally, he smiled. To me, that was victory. He didn't want to smile. He wanted to be mad all day. So, that was a very watered-down version, by the way. I have a question at the front. Okay. Um, yesterday I asked your favorite stunt. Do you remember your favorite stunt? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> I don't. We did so many stunts, and, um, let's see. I got you. Jump. Oh, I'll tell you that the, actually the, the most frightening stunt is always the most fun too. Is they harness you to a wire. And we work in a sound stage that's about this big, it's huge. And they hook you up to the rafters. And um, it was. Shut up! Um, what was the name of the show where I beat myself up? Doppelganger, yeah, doppelganger. And um, I had to fight myself, and I actually, you know, had to do all the stunts on both sides. And the harness, that's a, it's a really dangerous thing. I go flying off the second floor balcony through the metal gate and out and over. And, um, and I'm all harnessed up, and you gotta gird it up, and you gotta, they gotta kinda tell you, so, you know, you gird up, and you can throw your back at him. And I'm sitting there, do this big fight. It doesn't happen. And we do the whole thing again. The guy screwed up, it doesn't happen. And the director stops, he goes, you know, I need to know what to do. <laughs> oh. I mean, I go flying right through, not the fake metal fence, the real one. But I went right through it. And uh, of course, everybody was hovering around me because I was two floors down on the floor. Uh, but it looked great. Yeah. Those dumb men don't get paid enough money. Man. I tell you, those guys, work. they're the toughest guys. They work so hard, they get paid nothing. It's a really bad job. We have a question over here. Now I, now I can't hear it again. What is the first embarrassing thing that has ever happened? Oh, wow. <laughs> On television? That's a lot of Okay, the most embarrassing thing that I'll tell you the truth, that I relive really this. Okay. My close group of friends, I'm going to tell you. 
school? I they recruited me to play basketball in high school because they thought for some reason that I was good. And I wasn't good. I never even really played basketball, but I was sitting there and the team was playing basketball and I just threw a couple three uh, three pointers. They went in. And the coach goes, oh, do that again. And I did it just two more times. I just got lucky. We need you on the team. Puts me on the team. Convinces me that I've got a gift to play basketball. I then sit on the bench for the next five games. I don't do anything. Now I'm pretty jaded in Seneca. I'm just sitting on the bench. And all of a sudden he goes, play again! Feel the ball. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Lay up. It's the most beautiful thing. I'm turning around to get the glory. And everybody's just looking at me. This is a wrong basket. <laughs> I quit. I quit. That was pretty embarrassing. There's just no, no way to wiggle away from that situation. So, there you go. Hello. I'm a but working in the industry, what is the coolest thing you've had happen? The coolest thing to happen working in my industry? Yeah. Alright, I'm excited. Adobe Photoshop me on a dollar bill. The guy goes, no, no, no. It's a dollar bill. The US Treasury makes it, and I can actually use it. And I was like, oh, man. That's the coolest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. So I took a picture of this, and I sent it to all my friends, telling them, I'm so money. <laughs> And those are props. Between that and my action figure, I have very little humility. I'm pretty cocky. And sometimes you can find me in my house with my action figure, just <laughs> talking to it. You know, my wife comes along. She's like, "What are you doing? I'm talk to the action figure. Talk to the action figure." So uh, that's what happens when you're out of work. Now you're playing with it and you put your own action figure. Yeah. We've got a question over here. And I mean, every now and then you see these guys with a bunch of brass walking around the set. You don't know who they are. I mean, one guy ran NORAD, which is the uh, North American something, something, something. He had a lot of nuclear bombs on his mind. And he goes, uh, you know, your sideburns aren't regulation. And I said, well, we're in Hollywood. <laughs> I didn't say it. I was not being disrespectful, but I was like, you know, it's, it's Hollywood. Really. He goes, no, but that's not a regulation. You need to fight. I go, what are you going to give me? You know, what do I get to do? I said, I'll tell you what, you get me on an F 16, I'll cut one on the side of me. He goes, all right, we just walk out. Next day, he comes out and goes, all right, we do fly two weeks out of Nellis Air Force Base. I said, whoa, that's cool. Uh, so I went down there, and um, we went to the pre-flight training. Now these things fly at like 800 miles an hour, or even faster, and they're, they're incredible machines. And they, trick, they, they train you to do an isometric thing every time you turn. So the pilot looks like George Clooney, acts like George Clooney. This guy's cooler than anybody in Hollywood. You know, he's got his sunglasses and a little bit. 
He's like, all right, Joe, you know, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go left, and uh, I'm gonna go one, two, three, left, and we're good. And I've got a G suit on. Whatever you do, don't eat, you know? We're traveling at some very serious speeds, and they're calling me 10 Gs. It's like, whoa, okay. I get out there, and I get my name on the plane. They painted my name on the plane. It's incredibly cool. And I get in there, we're about to take off, I see you clearly take off. Boom. We hear some weird noise. <laughs> Planes broken. Great. I gotta wait six more hours on the tarmac, 115 degrees, for them to fix it, which they don't fix it. They get another plane, they paint another name on the plane. I was like, guys, you don't have to do that. No way, they don't want to hear it. They deal with details. I, I had to eat for 26. Yeah, not eat for 12 hours. I had a sloppy joe in the mess hall, which is all I have, by the way. And uh, we took off, and he didn't tell me anything. He didn't say left, right? He was like, hey, Joe. <laughs> I mean, I threw it all over the place. I was like, you got to be kidding me. And he's laughing. I mean, it's, he thinks it's hilarious. Because he's like, yeah, you play it, of course, but I'm on TV, buddy. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> But I did get rid of the sloppy jump. And I was able to reclaim control of the plane. And I actually was able to fly pretty well. It's very cool. And it was one of the coolest experiences of my life, to be honest with you. That was another one of those cool things that you get to do. And I have so much respect for those guys in the armed services. They, they work so hard. And uh, they have damn good sloppy jokes. You're pushing that here? Yeah, they're pushing that here. And I feel bad for the guy who had to clean up. Jason Momoa, and uh, he was telling us in his panel 
There are all those little funny things he used to do with pillow and toothbrush. Yeah, I hate it, Jason. <laughs> now, did you know yeah. that he was doing things with your toothbrush in his bum? <laughs> What's it like working with someone so amazing? Such an amazing this is, you know, you're worse than Millie, Millie Vanilli or whatever the hell you guys know. Jason, stand up. I'm in a really difficult age where I'm still trying to convince them it's all real. I do fly to space, I do kill bad guys, I make it home in time for dinner. That's the way it works. And they start asking smart ass questions like, wait a minute, you weren't there. That ship's made of wood. My. Another satisfying thing is having your kids play with your own action figures. It's very cool. I said, as long as I'm the guy who wins all the times, you play with my action figure. But um, the teacher at school got asked me by my son Aiden, who was um, sitting with the kids in school, and they were like, oh, wh what's your dad doing? You know, my dad is fireman. He, like, you know, puts out fires. My dad is a banker. He, um, you know, he, he deals in money. And my kid just chimes in, my dad flies in space and kills bad guys. <laughs> you know, and, and this is a British teacher, and she's very proper. She's like, yeah, we think that's very cute. However, I think you need to tell them the difference between fiction and reality. And I was looking at her like, fuck off. I'm a superhero. Give me my kid, we're leaving. I never told him, obviously. I was like, you just keep telling lies to all your friends, buddy. I'll pay for the shrink in about 20 years, that's fine. Excuse my language, though. How are you? Oh. Yeah, you can do that. You certainly can. Yes. But you need White House security clearance. Oh, you got it. I'm a superhero. I'll just, just jump back on. Thank you. Um, yes, I did. My parents worked in politics. I worked in politics. I just worked on campaigns. Next thing you know, I'm 20 years old, and I'm an advance fan for George Bush Sr. And an advance fan organizes trips where if George Bush came to Melbourne, Sr., he worked for W, by the way, right? Right? Um, and you organize everything down to security, down to the hotels, down to everything. And um, I thought this was this was intense because I was. You Attention, know, all um, attend Armageddon um, attendees. Please note that the wrestling has been postponed until approximately three thirty. Oh. Um, and I was in college, you know, just been a college kid, and next thing you know, I'm in a motorcade with the President of the United States, acting, trying to act as serious as possible. I had, I had a look, and you know, I was like, I work at the White House. And our job was, we'd go to cities, and you'd tell them, oh, hi, how are you? You'd tell the police chief and the mayor and everybody else, these are the things we require for a presidential trip, or a vice presidential trip. And I'd always be like, 
just didn't work for me. I'd be like, Joe, find out you're not to represent the White House. And they'd look at me like, you're a 20 year old kid, man. <laughs> Who are you? I'd be like, I work for the White House. Thank you. I got myself into a little bit of trouble. I would work very hard in the old executive office building, and I know that I was always hungry and they didn't give me any breaks to eat. Domino's Pizza guaranteed a 30 minute delivery. So I would call Domino's Pizza and be like, I want my pizza. Well, an hour and a half later, a guy would show up terrified, finally getting into the office with a cold pizza. I'm like, dude, what's up? 30 minutes, bro, that's a free pizza. <laughs> and he got like hand searched. I mean, he made it. We did that a lot. I got a lot of free pizzas. That's called an abuse of power. And um, so that's where it started. Little innocent abuses of power. And then finally, what happened was I was on the road in Charlotte, North Carolina, and George Bush Sr. was doing a big fundraising dinner, and it was like a couple thousand dollars a plate or whatever, and everybody thinks they're George Bush's best friend. You know? And that's what politicians do. They make you think you're, they're your best friend. And of course, they don't even remember you. And all of them wanted to shake hands and talk to them and take pictures with them. So we had a line set up. You see how they get lines here? You have to have some organization. Well, these guys were very offended at having velvet ropes and being manhandled into a line when they're paying that much money and they all think their George Bush is a best friend. So I said, you gotta do it, you gotta keep it up. Somebody took it down. And so when, the, when Bush came into the place to have dinner, he got swarmed, absolutely swarmed. The Secret Service were furious at him because it's a, it's a little dangerous. Second thing, I put him, I put him behind schedule by like 30 minutes. I just screwed up the most important man in the world with his schedule. I was like, ugh. Oh. So they made me pay. They took me off the road. Told you, I managed to get myself in trouble. I don't know why. You know, I guess he has a very strict schedule. Anyways, but it was interesting. We have a question from all down the back here. You want a dollar bill? <laughs> Action figure? I will be happy to give you a hug and kiss. Just work your way up to the sweaty guy called men over there. And, you know. Anyway, uh, so I hope I answered the politics question. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of cool. Hi. Oh, wait, watch this. Ready? All right. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. You see how good that was? It's an actual question. Yeah. Uh, oh, we have a question. Good. Uh, who what? Who Oh, absolutely, Chris Hardell. Yeah. Poor Chris. Here's Chris. Here's like this amazing actor. He's like a powerful actor, and all we did is stick makeup. And the poor guy had to come in at like four in the morning to get this stuff done to him. And I was like, why don't we use him for a real role? But he managed to get many of those and he can, will continue to do so. But uh, it was fun. He played every major race that we had. And uh, yeah, so he's great. And he's great too. Yeah. She's a lot better looking than you, Chris. <laughs> Who's next, Dad? Down the front, I think we've got a question. Oh. Hi, Hello. My question is, how is love changing Oh, well, interesting question. Since we were just talking about that. <laughs> um, Chris was hilarious because he's very patient. He's much more patient than I am. And what was funny is that Chris and I, I remember 
having we had long, pretty serious conversations with Chris. And then I'd stop and I'd be like, talking to a guy named Manly, that's gotta kind of be weird. Like, literally. Having a serious conversation with a guy who looks like an alien is funny. I guess you have to be there. Keep going, keep going. All right. Hello. Captain, I'm sorry to have a call. Okay. So how do you get your pants to have that Ah. <laughs> it's like the secret formula for the crappy patty. Um, I have calyx all over the place. See, you know, there's this guy, Paul, what's his name? Gillian, whatever. Something like that. Worked on the show once. Who uses a lot of products. But I think he has a separate suitcase just filled with products. I, on the other hand, I have very unruly hair. And I actually got in trouble in school once. I mean, the dean for our school brought me in once and combed my hair down. He was just so mad. He thought I was, it was an act of insubordination or something. But the shorter you cut it, too, the more it would stick up. And he tried combing it down, and it just wouldn't work. And it also had, it's, it, it's caused a few problems on a number of productions where they want me to be super clean cut. You can cut my hair really short, or you can grow it really long, but pretty much anything in between, it's going to tweak out. <laughs> and uh, we introduced, I believe, an industrial strength polymer called Gaff Quad. That's what we tried to use for a TV show. I don't remember the name of the TV show was. What? Oh, Providence, you're right. Ah, yeah, good. And they were so frustrated, they were in there, they hadn't even come in early, and they had like 14 layers of like industrial strength polymer. It might, my head felt like a surfboard. It was like, <laughs> but sure enough, man, you get the shoot, and, <laughs> and it drove them crazy. And um, thank God I was in a production the last five years where you just work with it. It's, it's a lot easier when you just work with it. And in fact, for those of you that are going to do TV shows in the future, when they go to do your hair and makeup, make sure that it's the lowest maintenance you can do. These are little things that happen, by the way, they're very funny, that a lot of actors don't think about. And then you say, well, 100 episodes later, I shouldn't have worn a wig. Because then you have to be in two hours early every day for work for the next five years. Add that up, then you stole a chunk of your life. And so I would stroll in 15 minutes before shooting, and be like, Got my gun? Let's shoot. And Jason, on the other hand, who decided to cut his hair in hiatus, had to come in early every day to get a wig. So I was laughing. And then he had to stay longer afterwards to get the wig taken out. So, so there. <laughs> Who's name? Can I join? Thanks for uh, making this series really uh, When it Thank comes you. to science fiction, how do you feel about life in the cosmos? About who? Life in the cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ooh, heavy. Well, it's funny you ask me. Um, it's a question my kid asks all the time. It's a question that you can just ponder forever. I think that my feeling about it, there's two there's two elements to that question. One is the real question, is there life out there? I personally think statistically there has to be some form of life. With those numbers, statistically there has to be some form of life. The other question is the metaphor kind of aspect of science fiction. And one thing that I think is so powerful about science fiction, the reason we have such a loyal fan base for science fiction, is that they managed to, in one genre, really harness the entire collective aspirations of almost every culture on the planet. 
every culture on the planet can relate to A, traveling and discovering, and B, being united in the process of doing that. And so I think all these cultures just connect immediately to science fiction and those aspects of it, and particularly like a show like ours, where it travels well all over the world. It doesn't require a lot of uh, uh, cultural translations. Um, a, action, everybody gets action. And B, every culture from like, you know, the Kikuyu to, you know, Jason's tribe, whoever that is, all want to reach out and explore the cosmos. So, um, I know there's life out there. And once you meet the rest of my family, you know why. We have a question right up the back. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, were you a fan of sci-fi before you did your show, or did it convert you? Well, I, I, my favorite films were always science fiction films, but I didn't watch much television, and I didn't... When I thought of sci-fi, I thought of Star Trek television. Which, by the way, I didn't even get where I grew up. We had like two channels. I, mean, I grew up in a culturally lamest outpost in the world, I guarantee you. And, um, but we did have Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, big influence on my life. Um, but I became, I really began to respect science fiction television. Uh, the more I did it, the more, the more I realized how difficult it was and the parameters involved. Um, so now I watch science fiction quite a bit, and I really like it. The only thing I don't really like, and I don't gravitate to, is the incredibly earnest approach to science fiction television. I always like the fun aspect of it. And I know that a lot of people these days are trying to make TV shows that are serious. We're serious. We're doing serious things, because we want to get an Emmy nomination. Fine, do it. I personally, I'm not going to generally watch that show, unless they're so good. And you can do it on a $200 million budget science fiction film, but when you're working with $2.5 million to do an episode of television, you better have some, some trick up your sleeve, because if it doesn't look damn good, you better be able to turn to the audience and wink in the eye and be like, all right, you get it. We're trying as hard as we can. And I think Stargate had that quality of self-deprecation, and I think that did really well. I haven't seen the new show, but I heard that it, I don't know, I don't know if it's there or not, but if they're smart, we'll keep it. So, hello. He's the smartest, too. We don't want to back you All right. I shot them all, I think. Then I... Wait, hold on. Hey, stop interrupting me. No, this is the funny one. I love the fact I fed the ladies... The, I fed the guy to the race. You like that one? I was like, ooh, that's dark. I like that. Everybody argued the network call, and they go, ooh, he's the hero of our show. He's feeding humans to the race. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. So. Glad on the right bond is that the next movie being photographed early next year is an Atlantis movie. Can you confirm or like give us a SP1 movie? About the Stargate movie? Yes. God, if it was up to me, we'd be doing it. Um, <laughs> It's the hardest question to answer. This question gets asked everywhere I go, and I always feel I'm in a very difficult position to answer it truthfully. I don't have any indications to me that the, the movie's gonna happen. Uh, unless they're doing it without me, and maybe they are, who knows. Um, and I wouldn't put it past them either. Um, but I don't know if that information because it's not good news, is the type of information they want out there while they're trying to launch a new series. And I just don't think they're serious about doing a movie. 
Uh, and I don't know why, because uh, I think it's, uh, it's profitable. Um, and for Christ's sakes, we gotta figure out some ending to the show. I mean, I'm, we're hovering over San Francisco in a floating city. What's up? It's just plain weird. Yeah. Well, I, I've told them many things. They just, they just don't want to hear it. That's all. I'm, I, in that sense, I'm very much like my character. I, I probably have some authority issues. Do you, do you have a question up here? Uh, did I do it? Hello. Uh, this is a, uh, a specific question about the episode of Las Vegas. Yeah. Five. Yeah. What was it like to play uh, Detective John Shepard as opposed to Colonel John Shepard? It was great. It was awesome. I love that episode. It was fun to shoot. I don't know if you guys... Have you seen Vegas? Yes? No? Yes, no. That was about half half. Um, I don't think it's aired here in Australia, so that means you probably download it. And I want to talk to you guys after this. <laughs> oh. Okay. Gee, back up. Okay. They bought DVDs. But the, the, the question was... Uh, it, it was fun, and Robert Cooper and I really enjoyed doing that movie a lot. That that episode felt like a movie. It was the last thing I ever shot, and um, we had the discussion of how to create this character and make him enough similar enough and yet different enough. And the idea was coming up with this kind of beat up, jaded detective guy, and I think it worked. It was cool, and it was just weird. It was the last episode I ever shot. Period. After five years of working on the show, my last moment on a Stargate set was in a suite in Las Vegas. <laughs> as the sun was coming up and killing our shot, and we had been working for 24 hours, and, and they are like, all right, all right, all right see, you. see you later, bye. <laughs> that was it. So it was very weird. It was a weird place to end the movie, and the series as well. And. Uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens. Hi, Jeff. Hello. I was just wondering if you've heard anything you can tell us about uh, the upcoming projects. Are you work for your dream or any other series? Um, there isn't really a shortage of work. There's a shortage of good work. Yes. And after you do, uh, if you're lucky enough to play what I play in my series, I, I'm, I'm holding out for the right thing. Much to the frustration of some of my agents who would rather just put me on a show. I'm like, I don't want to just do a show. And I'm way too egotistical to not be the star of the show, so come on. Uh, but I have waited and waited and waited. They did ask me to do something that I decided Ah, what the hell I'll do it 24 days of work. And it was for a TV show called Warehouse 13. And um, it was nothing. I didn't even do anything. But incredibly, the fans showed up for that episode when it went on the air. And it became the biggest, highest rated show in the 17 year history of the network. Highest rated anything, any movie, anything they've ever done. And so I got a phone call from the network saying, hey, you know, Maybe we should, we should do a TV show together. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was pretty thankful that the fans showed up to watch that. I think the message got through to the network. There's a Stargate fan base, and they want to watch something. And they're going to follow the guys they like into a new show. And then I think there's a group of people saying, uh, well, there's a Stargate fan base, and all they care about is the name Stargate. And, and we'll just put the name Stargate on a different show. And we don't know. Jury's out. We don't know what, what the end result will be. But maybe both are true. Who knows? So we have time for one more question right at the back here. All right. Hi. You had a lot of... You had a lot of potential suicide missions. In, yeah, what's up with that? In Stargate Atlantis, were yeah. concerned that each one was going to be your last? No, I was way too cocky to everything. I was like, they're not getting rid of me. They can't. Um, but the truth is, they probably could. Um, the, um, uh, I, 
I wasn't worried, and that's a question that a lot of people ask also, because I personally didn't care. I was like, look, I'm, I'm doing a good job with what I've been given. And if it's not good enough for you, then hey, I'll move along. Life's too short. So I was never really worried about that aspect. Um, and um, as far as the, the storylines they create, you know, they killed Paul with an exploding tumor. Oh, that's always a good joke between us castmates. When Hewlett and I and everybody are together, all we have to do is say exploding tumor. And in a nutshell, that's our entire experience. They can kill you very fast with an exploding tumor. So, uh, no, I wasn't really worried about getting chopped like that. No. Uh, and, but that's, that's a fear that I think a lot of people work with as actors in Hollywood. And I think it's a phony fear. I think the truth is uh, you can't really live and work properly that way. Um, and it's, that's just a power play that I'm not part of. Yes, can I help you? Well, that is a bad time. Oh, a bad time. he's going to sell some toothpaste also in a minute. But before we thank Joe, because this has been a fantastic session, we do have a special announcement to make right. before you go for all the Stargate fans. This is breaking news. This is the bill from last night. 